today and as today's speaker. Um, just a little anecdote, Bill and I, I've only been here for about five months, not quite five months yet. Bill and I have spent many hours though <laughs> in the hallway chatting about innovation and career and technical education and how to make sure that we get our students the right one with both technical competencies and soft skills so that they're successful out in the workplace. Um, increasingly, we hear these conversations out there in the news. This is what employers want and what they seek from students who come from programs like those down at Highlands College, and we're always thinking about new ways to make sure that we're getting that appropriate blend. And uh, two examples for you, um, every day when we're in the hallway, there are always at least two or three groups of students that come by, and Bill hollers out their instructions for the day and says, go down to the lab and get started on this. And he knows that those students are going down to the lab, they get things done. Um, but Bill actually is joining us this afternoon. He's been on the, on the job site with his students. They're off setting walls this afternoon on a community project. And so, again, as typical current technical education, particularly in small communities, um, we do have a, a very strong local impact. And I would say that Bill has a number of projects around town um, that benefit our public, where his students are actually at work and they're putting their skills to work and learning their trade. Um, so I think that's an important part of what we do down at Tech and, and one of the values that Bill and I definitely do share um, about what goes on at Highlands. Um, Bill's a journeyman uh, through registered apprenticeship. He has in parentheses the original four-year degree program. Um, <laughs> he have, has a, a, had a long career, successful career in construction and construction technology before deciding in 2008 to pursue interest in teaching and coming to Highlands College. It was College of Technology at that time. Um, he has since earned two associate's degrees. He earned his Bachelor of Applied Science in um, Organizational Communication and Management and a Master of Science in Project Management a project engineering management and technical communication and is currently working on his uh, doctoral degree in educational leadership from the University of Montana. Um, while he is a tenured faculty member teaching full time in our department as well. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bill and uh, let him do my thing. All right. Thanks, Heather. So. Like she said, I'm not a product of a college education. I came from apprenticeship. Um, I'll give you some background through my slideshow, but you know, I worked for a construction company. I was sweeping up the shop. I was just, it was fun. It was something to do in the summer. I worked steady all summer long and every day after school. And I started looking at going to college. I got decent grades. I did okay in school. I could have you know, applied myself. But then again, I like to have a lot of fun in high school, a lot of fun. And I knew that if I went to college, I would probably waste all my money or somebody else's money. At least I had enough insight to know my own self that I would do something dumb and flunk out of college. So when the company I worked for, they said, what are you thinking about doing? I said, well, I went and checked out uh, Helena College of Technology. They have a construction program. What do you think? And they said, well, why would you do that? If we can get you an apprenticeship, will you come work for us? And at this time, apprenticeship was hard to get. There was a waiting list. And somehow, these guys knew me long enough. They pulled some strings. And I was very lucky to get into an apprenticeship with this company. And they kept me on my entire apprenticeship. It became like a family. These guys I looked up to, but they also held me to a very, very high standard. And they kicked me in the you know what plenty of times when I would slack off and forget to show up for work because I was having too much fun the night before. And you know, you, you need that every once in a while. Okay? And so <clears throat> I got lucky to the whole apprenticeship with this company. Other apprentices that I went to school with, they would work on a big sheetrocking job, putting sheetrock on metal studs, and a great big like REC when that was being built. I remember that this guys were working on that. And then what are you gonna do? What's the next part for you? Well, as soon as sheetrock's up, I'll have a month off and then they'll find me another job, probably hanging sheetrock on metal studs. They're getting pigeonholed into these, these jobs. I was lucky enough, the company I worked for, we did everything from digging the hole, setting the foundation, doing the floor systems, wall system, light residential, commercial, big commercial, we did everything. And so I got a real well-rounded education through that apprenticeship. Moving forward, I started my own company uh, a few years after apprenticeship, running jobs for my, for my former boss. Um, had a bit of a falling out, so I started my own company and I did really well. I was building big buildings, Ashley Furniture Store in Great Falls. 
big building, um, ran that as a subcontractor for another, for a larger contractor that was out of Bozeman. Um, airplane hangars across the state, I got into steel building construction, but steel building houses doing residential remodels sometimes have three crews at three different places in the state, and I'd have to bounce around between all three of them all week long to keep things on track. After a little while, that company that I ran the job for in Great Falls, I was a subcontractor, they were the general, called me out of the blue and said, hey, we liked what you did for us. You know, we were three weeks behind before your crew started, and you put us three weeks ahead the way you built that out, the way you guys showed up every day and just worked hard. Oh, okay, great. You know, bonus would be nice, but that wasn't in, the, wasn't in the works, right? There was no performance bonus on that one. He did say, we have a $25 million car dealership job, four buildings, 16 acres. We want to hire you. We want to buy out your company. We want you to run that job. Okay. So uh, basically, they start out the conversation, are you tired of hiring, firing, and doing paperwork and all the stuff that a business owner has to do? And I said, oh, yeah. Yes, I am. It was hard to find good help. Um, Turns out some of my help I didn't even know it, but they were stealing, stealing out from under me. And that's really hard to recover from when you're a small business. And uh, so I said, yep, yep, as soon as I finish this job, I owe it to this customer to finish out, and then I'll be there. Got there, ran that job. In the middle of that, that was about 2007, 2008. We'll, do, we'll talk about it here, what happened in 2008. There was a construction crisis. There was a housing crisis that caused construction to, to really bottom out. And where was most of the construction happening in Montana at that time? Bozeman, Montana, where that job was, okay? So I was the last superintendent and I was an assistant project manager working for the company that had over million dollar projects all over the, we call it Glitter Gulch in Bozeman there. All these different projects out of 10 superintendent project manager combos, I was the last guy working. But I had filled out an application to go teach construction courses at Great Falls College in Great Falls, that's where I'm from, that's where my house was. I could throw a rock really hard from my house and probably hit the college if I wanted to, and I was hoping to get back home because I was living out of a fifth wheel in Bozeman because it's really expensive to live in Bozeman, right? My family was in Great Falls, fill out a job application for Great Falls College. I called them and said, should I even put in? I don't have a college education. I'm a journeyman carpenter, but here's my experience. Oh, you should put in, and I never heard a word. Not even a call back. Like, well, it was a shot in the dark anyway. Not. Three weeks later, I see a very, very similar application in for Montana Tech in the paper. Well, I already wrote the thing. I just adjusted a little bit because that historic preservation piece to it, which I had a lot of experience in. Send it in, get an interview. They ask if I want to take the job. I accepted the job because they said, if you come help us here, if you help us teach, you teach this program, we're going to help you get a college degree. And I'd always wanted, I'd, I can't say I regret doing apprenticeship, but I'd always I always knew that that college degree would open up more doors. And that's why I do what I do now, because I'm trying to blend the two. The way I run my program, the way I run my students, it's an all-day program like apprenticeship, but they're getting college credit at the same time so that more doors will open. They've got those soft skills. They've got the education to back up what they're learning, right? So when I offered, or when I went to tell the boss, because I was the last superintendent working, um, hey, I got a job offer from Montana Tech in Butte. He goes, he says, what are they going to pay you? And I said, half? Half of what you're paying me? He goes, then why would you take it? They offered to help me get a college degree. And you remember when you told me that I couldn't move up because I didn't have a college degree? He goes, yeah. I said, that's why. They said I could teach, get me a college degree. You said I need one. He goes, you're right. You got me. You can come back in six days, six months, six years. It doesn't matter. You always have a job here. Good luck. And we still keep in touch. But as you heard from Heather's intro, I'm not done learning yet. I'm still working on this craft. I consider education, being a good educator, being a good teacher, a good communicator, it's a whole nother craft. I learned one craft and I'm good at that and I still love doing that. My next job, my next craft, my next vocation is education. And that's why I chose an educational doctorate because I think we've all been in a classroom with somebody who is probably just brilliant and super good in their, in their discipline. But man, it's hard to take a classroom because they just don't know how to communicate. Right? They don't know how to really effectively teach. I don't want to be that guy. I want people to want to come to my classes and want to learn. So let's get started. All right, so career technical education is vocational. It's also academic, okay? There's a big piece of it. Uh, it applies to schools, institutions, and educational programs that specialize in skilled trades, like I did, okay? Um, applied sciences, that's what we offer in many of our programs at Highlands College is applied sciences. 
uh, modern technologies. Speaking of modern technologies, anybody watching this little thing right here? You see this swivel? This is modern technology, and this is what I'm using, in, or going to begin to use in my classroom so I can record all of my lectures, and I can break it into small snippets, because students don't like to, I mean, they, they'll interface with a machine like this much more than a book. They would rather watch a video than read a book. But then again, when they watch videos that aren't cool and don't have a whole bunch of you know, gunfights and car chases, then it minimizes to even smaller amounts. So I can take a lecture just like this, I can break it into small snippets, put it into our learning, uh, online learning platform, Moodle, and they're still gonna get the same education. Also, and I'll talk about it later, I wanna develop uh, lectures, I wanna develop videos so that I can take my program and they don't have to be in the classroom. Apprentices like me could take three to six credits a semester, see my face, see the rest of my students' faces, feel like they're part of our classroom, and get their college degree while working full time. If that existed when I was in my apprenticeship, I would have been all over it. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it didn't exist and it still kind of doesn't. Not with a hands-on program like we've got, okay? And most importantly, we're doing career preparation. My guys, as Heather said, I'm on them all the time. They have to be in my classroom at eight o'clock in the morning, right? That's when work starts, that's when class starts. It's training them to get used to getting up and being somewhere first thing in the morning because that's what your boss wants. Um, it's also being responsible and being reliable. I have an attendance policy. If you're not gonna make it, you have to send an email before eight o'clock or you have to call the office phone. Don't text me, don't call my cell phone, right? That's only for emergencies. But you have to send an email or call the office phone before 8 a.m. and you get an excused, okay? So you don't get the full points for the day, but you don't get a zero, right? Things happen, flat tire on the way down, running out of gas, gotta stop and get gas. Call, leave a message, say, hey, I'm gonna be a little bit late. You've, you've covered yourself. I do that because when I had to run crews and people didn't show up, I've got four guys working here, five guys working here, you know, three guys over there and somebody or two people don't show up, I gotta rearrange everything. And that slows down my production, I can't get as much done. I want them to learn that they have to be responsible, reliable, and they have to be somewhere all day. That's what work is, okay? Uh, the objectives of this, I, need to, I wanted to identify how the millennials and Generation X, so I'm a Generation Xer, but anybody, we'll see the, de we'll see the information up here, uh, how the millennials, the tail end of that Generation X and millennials view the perceptions of career technical education. Um, freshmen in co uh, college, freshman and sophomore college students, how they perceive CTE, career technical education, which is what we're gonna talk about mainly, because they, uh, they're just a couple of years, most of them are just a few years removed from high school. So now they've had a little bit of experience out there on their own, they've had some college classes. So what do they think of those high school career technical education courses that they had? Um, observe the perceptions of high school and college students who did not have CTE education or courses offered in high school. So there's a lot of schools, private schools, small schools, they don't have much to offer, right? Especially in the hands-on trades. And so what are their thoughts? What are their perceptions of career technical education? Um, the hypothesis, perceptions of career and technical education, careers are positive, but decide, despite this consideration of CTE coursework and training, uh, going into those careers are, are low. So let's see what we came up with. Billy, you're gonna ruin your life. You know who told me that? My best friend the year I graduated high school because he was going to college and I wasn't. And he was genuinely concerned for me. You have to go to college, you're gonna ruin your life. Well, so let me give you a background on him. He went to college, he went down to two years of school in Phoenix and finished up part of the degree and, and got a certification but didn't finish all of the degree, came back to Montana. He worked in that industry, he was, he was down there for drafting and design. Okay, engineering drafting, engineering design, and he got a really good job when he got back to Great Falls designing a whole bunch of stuff for the military base. And it worked out really well for a while, but then he got kind of bored with it. He goes, I really, I thought this would be more, you know, out on the job doing stuff, not building everything in CAD. You know, he was good at it, he had the mind for it. So, after a couple other uh, ventures he went into, he says, what do I do, what do I do, Bill? I, I, I need something. We got him into a plumbing apprenticeship. I had some connections. He knew some connections. He got into a plumbing apprenticeship. And now, with that mind he's got, with that drafting background, that design background, he can go into just about any job. He doesn't need a set of prints. He can draw his own. 
he can develop his own set of prints because that's what he did and then plumb, pipe, do whatever he needs to do for whatever that is, which landed him a really good job. He's now a cryogenic technician. Anybody want to anybody guess what a cryogenic technician does? What's that? Something with your body? Well, that's what everybody thinks. Oh, you freeze dead bodies. No, not really. What's that? Stuff. It, well, it it's, a fancy, it's a fancy title for the guy. He got hired by a big company. He goes in and he pipes in all the specialty gases for every clinic, every hospital in like three states. Okay? It's a combination of that degree that he got, that education, and that hands-on skill set set him up. I mean, he is, he's a busy guy, they pay him really well. It's a cool job, plus, what a cool title, right? He gets to say, I'm a cryogenic technician, everybody goes, whoa, what's that? And then he makes up a lie about how cool it is. It's basically just piping in, you know, it's being a plumber, but with specialty gases, okay? So where did we start? I'm gonna go back, the lit review for this, there's almost no, it's very, very little literature about the perceptions of career technical education, um, how career technical education came to be. Most of it is, is actual data that just covers, we need more people, there's a workforce shortage, or we have a glut of these people, um, who's working in this type of industry, who's working in this type of industry, those type of things. So a lit review is really tough. But um, what started career technical education? What do we used to call it? It was vocational education, right? It was voc ed. Um, factory workers. In 1917, in the Smith Hughes Act, the factory workers were facing a, a shortage. There was a shortage of workers. This was the Industrial Revolution. Well, back at that time, the United States was mostly an agrarian culture. We were farming. We were ranching. We had the Industrial Revolution happen. Factory workers needed more people for production. So families from farms, families from those agrarian cultures started moving into the cities to fill those factory jobs because they paid well. Okay? shift from agriculture to in industry. We brought in immigrants from other countries to fill those jobs. Farm kids, farm kids would go to work in these factories, okay? But what are those parents bringing with them? What are those immigrants bringing with them? Is their families, when they move into the cities, high schools in the cities were not equipped to take on all of those students. One, because they probably didn't have the formal education that most high school students in those cities had, which high schools in those days were meant for the upper class. They were meant for more the elite class. So they didn't know how to handle or what to do with these type of students. Smith Hughes Act developed vocational education. Let's teach them the skills they need to take over that factory job for mom, for dad, for whomever when they get done. Okay? Who's that guy? Anybody know him? Nope. That's John Dewey, the philosopher, the social critic, the educator. I'm a big fan of John Dewey. He's a very, he was a very, very smart man. Okay? He had a lot to do with education, vocational education. Uh, he's, he was opposed to vocational education. Okay, and I know what you're thinking. He's opposed to it, well, what a jerk. Why would he be opposed to that? He was actually opposed to it because he thought it would build in a class distinction right into, the, right into public education. You're gonna create a tiered system. There's gonna be the elites, there's gonna be the smart ones, and then you've got this vocational piece. So he was actually, his philosophy, education is education is education. If you're working, if you're learning, that's education. If you're in a classroom and you're learning, that's education. Education's education, education. It doesn't matter which way you come about it. If you're learning and you're learning a skill, you're learning something that's gonna prepare you to be a productive member of society, that's education. So uh, we're gonna come back to him uh, and we're gonna see, let see if he was right, okay? Some more of the history. What do you see when you see that picture? That iconic picture of these guys eating lunch, smoking cigarettes, lighting cigarettes on top of a steel beam. Central Park in the background in that upper, upper right corner, you can just see Central Park. Uh, you wouldn't catch me doing that. These guys walk those beams like they were nothing. Have you ever seen the videos where they're throwing those super hot rivets at each other and catching them in their leather aprons, loading them up and building a lot of the structures that are still there? That's iconic, right? There was a big respect, huge respect for people that did this kind of work, okay? So if there was a golden age when career technical education, vocational education was really at its peak, I would put it between World War II and 1970, okay? That was when uh, grandfathers, fathers, the families, they kind of had their own vocation. My dad was a plumber, I'm a plumber, my grandfather was a plumber. It was something to be proud of. We've sort of lost that, but well, let's talk about this golden age. What these folks did, well, Rosie the Riveter, Okay, World War II, when all the men went off to fight, who picked up 
the hammers, who picked up the welders, who picked up, uh, you know, and, and took over those jobs for the war effort. It was the women. Women did that, right? So there was a national buy-in. This is important for the country. This is what we do. Rosie the Riveter was a big piece of that. Many people call them the greatest generation because they think the interstate system. You think all of these buildings, the infrastructure, all the stuff that they built, looking forward, looking at the future, our country's gonna need this, our children are gonna need this, our grandchildren are gonna benefit from this. Let's build it out, okay? They did infrastructure, dams, bridges, roads, big buildings, suburbanization, okay? Cities were getting kind of crowded. What happens with suburbanization was they're making a good wage, they can afford now to go out and they can buy that leave it to beaver type house with a yard and two cars so they can drive in, do their work in the city, wherever they happen to be, but it also led to more growth, growth of families, growth of that, that family dynamic, you're out of the city. It was a great generation. So where did we go from there? Remember we went, uh, sorry, World War II to the 1970s. But what happened between the 1970s and up here, this A Nation at Risk, it was a document published by the Department of Education in 1983, uh, the shift to a college prep curriculum because we built cars. We were engineers. But who started to beat the pants off of us when it came to those two things? The Japanese with cars, had a boy, the Japanese, they were building cars cheaper. They were building them more cost, well, cost effectively. They had better gas mileage and they lasted longer. How about engineering? Who was the other one? What were we afraid of? What do we always tout? Boy, it's a good, it's a good thing. It, what they think uh, BMW, think Mercedes Benz. What's that? Germany. German engineering. Well, Toyota, companies like that, Japanese car companies started beating us at our own game. And then people were starting to talk about German engineering. Engineering that wasn't ours, that was superior. Oh, we can't have that. This is the United States. No way. So what do we do? We're going to rewrite education and we're going to track everybody into a college prep. That's how we're going to be. We're going to create this knowledge based society. Um, so this was actually the, a document, a nation at risk is what they called it. Okay, let's scare everybody, a nation at risk. We're losing the battle, folks. We got to get everybody into college and we have to go into these disciplines because the Japanese and the Germans are beating us. Right? Speaking of World War II, bring back any, you know, is there a similarity there? Not so. So 1982 to 1994, there was a general decline in the interest of high school students in vocational education. One, probably because it was called vocational education. We're going to get to that. Vocational programs had become a kind of a dumping ground for kids who weren't succeeding in the traditional academic environment. I think we've seen that. I think we, we, uh, Maybe we, not, we, maybe we don't admit it, but we inherently know that that's, that's the stigma that we see in high schools. That's the stigma that we see in, in career technical education centers. That's the stigma we see at two-year schools, like Highlands. Oh, they'll never make it in this program. Let's get them into one of those. At least they can do something, right? I'm not a believer in that. So, but that's, that's the nature of it. Uh, I recently had, and this is completely anecdotal, but one of the high school teachers at Butte High. There's the career technical education wing, you probably know what I'm talking about. And there's a bunch of lockers there. I think the lockers are basically randomly assigned, right? One of the students had their locker down on that end of the building. Went to their counselor and said, hey, can you move my locker out of the special ed area? There's no special ed area down there, right? That's the trades area. That's the, career, that's the automotive, the construction, the welding. But can you move it out of the special ed area? So in many school districts, vocational education wasn't much more than a uh, second tier special ed program. So it's out there, that perception, those stigmas, they're out there. Um, as a result, CT is uh, tolerated in secondary education and in some cases uh, subjugated as a purgatory for undesirable students. This is where you track them. Those are shop kids, okay? Never gonna be anything, they're a shop kid. Um, and I'm afraid that this has been accepted as a modern reality. Although research shows there's no concrete evidence that such generalized perceptions and stereotypes are valid. Many studies show that students enrolled in CTE programs uh, can and do outperform students in traditional academic settings. You just gotta unlock the difference. You just, it, all it is is it's a different way of seeing the world and educating yourself, okay? Research shows that getting a bachelor's degree does on average 
result in, in higher pay. But there are associates and certificates out there, associates degrees and certificates, that can earn higher earnings than, than what a college student can make or somebody who did a traditional bachelor's degree. Okay? It's not the case in all of them, but on average those associate degrees and certificates are going to cost less, aren't they, to get. So you enter the workforce sooner, you're making more money, you have less cost attached to your education, you're not paying down that debt over a long period of time, you come out ahead. Just depends on which one you choose. Same thing happens when you choose a bachelor's degree, right? You're gonna pay money for it, it just depends on that market, which one you wanna go into. Does it have the dollar signs? When you signed up for that class, were you thinking dollar signs over your eyeballs? Or were you looking at something that you were passionate about? It just depends. All right, so this is interactive. First of all, can I do that? Do I look like Will Smith? Okay. Anyway, uh, that's what I look like when I'm really deep in thought. Does anybody, well, obviously you know that's Will Smith. And don't get me wrong, I don't blame Will Smith for this. He's just an actor. He doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, what's in the background? What are those blurred out images? Helmets. Football helmets. Do you know what movie this is from? Concussion. Concussion. The movie Concussion, right? So, this is interactive. In most classroom time and lectures, I don't say, hey, get out your phones and do this. But, get out your phones and do this. Google CTE. Just CTE. While I take a swig of coffee. Tell me what pops up. And don't be afraid if you butcher it. It's, it takes a while to learn how to say it. Okay. I heard brain condition. Anybody else? CT, which brain disease is it? Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Encephalopathy. See, I stumbled on it too. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, right? Brain damage. That's what the whole movie Concussion was about. NFL players constantly racking their heads. They end up with CTE. I hear it when I watch football, and it drives me crazy. Okay? Because anybody, scroll down. How many times do you have to scroll through before you find? Okay, there's one, there's two, there's three. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Oh, there it is. What is CTE? Today's cutting edge, rigorous, relevant career technical education. It took me 15 tries. I couldn't get 15 on the slide. 15 CTE references to brain damage before I actually got to our new acronym for vocational education, CTE. Is it because of the relevance? What's that? Is it because it's such a hot topic? Right it's now? a hot topic, absolutely. It's a hot topic, but unwittingly, unknowingly, I just talked about how it's a special, uh, it's a second tier special education program. That's what CTE is, or vocational education. That's where all the dumb kids go. And so we picked, we picked an acronym. It is also circle back around, circles back to brain damage. I hope I could, I want to change that. That would be nice, right? But when I hear CTE, when you hear CTE, more often than not, unless you're in the industry, unless you're in education, you're thinking brain damage. I teach CTE. Each brain damage, right? So, moving on, I just love putting that part in because I think it's relevant and gets your mind going, okay? Skills gap, it's a difference in skills required on the job and the actual skills possessed by the employees. Every business, every industry has some sort of skills gap. But right now, our trades, our welding trades, machining trades, construction, plumbing, electrical, they're seeing a big skills gap. That's what I hear from my industry partners is, I can't find, I can get people to come in the door but man, I gotta invest so much time and energy in training them. And sometimes they stick around, sometimes they realize this is real work and they leave. I've already invested that time and energy. How do we break down this skills gap? Much of the problem on this skills gap isn't just the, it's the number of people, not just what they don't know, but the number of people, meaning uh, the problem is blamed on retiring baby boomers and the fact that construction and manufacturing remains unattractive career paths for most students graduating high school. Okay? So, these aren't, you want to work with your back for the rest of your life? I heard that. That's what I heard from people when I decided to go into an apprenticeship and get my, you know, become a carpenter. Um, they're just, they're not attractive, okay? Even though they're high paying, you can make really good money doing it. I always tell people, listen, uh, I have a lot of friends that are accountants, doctors, lawyers, and whenever they need something done, who do you think they call? They call me. Hey, could you come help me do this? Even if they want to do it themselves, they need somebody to help them get started. And so if I come there and I do the work for them, I build their kitchen, set their cabinets, you know, remodel their bathroom, build an addition on their house, 
They make more money than a carpenter does, but what happens to their money when the bill comes due? Theirs goes down and mine goes up, all right? You can work as many hours and, and make as much money as you want with a skilled trade, okay? Um, but I don't charge my friends to do any work. Do you know why? Because then they owe me. That's why we call it trades, right? They owe me. If I need my taxes done, I have an accountant, okay? If I get in trouble, I've got a lawyer friend who's got my back, right? I hope I don't get in trouble, but I know I've got that in my back pocket if I need it. Many firms reporting having a hard time qual finding qualified workers to fill project manager and supervisor positions, and they include carpenters, laborers, equipment operators. That comes from the AGC, Association of General Contractors, CEO. They're having a hard time filling these jobs. How do we do that? How do we get them? How do we get people in there? We gotta change these perceptions. Uh, unfortunate and potentially devastating, the side effect of baby boom retirement is what I call the skilled, uh, skilled trades brain drain. When those old, older gray-haired folks who have 20, 30, 40 years of knowledge here, when they leave, they're gone. And if they don't have young people that are, they're mentoring for four years like an apprenticeship, five years, 10 years, that just goes away. So as the baby boomers leave and they take that knowledge with them, we're trying to fill it in with a bunch of new folks, right? And we've got education that'll help. We've got two-year programs like, like ours at Highlands. We've got things that'll help. But all of that knowledge, all that history, that institutional knowledge goes with these folks and, and the young ones coming up don't have a chance to get that. Okay, so we have gotta find a way to partner them up. We have gotta start some mentoring system. Even if some of these folks are retired, boy, it'd be real nice if we could get them to come back and, and help us teach, help us train the next generation because they have more, I've probably forgotten more in my life, or they've forgotten more in their lives than I'll ever know. And that was one of the biggest things. It's failing, see, technology. Heather, it thinks you have the thingy. Yeah, what? <laughs> I did my Will Smith. I didn't like it, apparently. Well, we'll see if it'll come back around. There it comes. Come on. Well, we'll see what happens. It might come back around. Technology, right? Like I said, it's my first try. First try with that machine right there. Okay, so brain drain, we're losing those folks. We want them to come back. So what I came through was apprenticeship. Is it giving you a background in the history of career technical education, routes that you can take to get into these type of trades? Uh, I know it's hard to see, I apologize. It includes some classroom training. I had to go to carpenter school it's in Helena. They have their own school for our apprenticeship, okay? On the job training, you're working. First of all, you know this, so don't answer it. And I, you know this because you're my wife, right? But how long? is a normal apprenticeship. And I get all kinds of answers from different two groups. Years. What's that? Two years. So two years? Anybody else? I've heard seven for some trades. Maybe as, up, as far up as seven. Mine was four years, okay? Four years. Electricians, I think they can go three years up to five years. Depends on which side of the trade. Linemen, I do believe, is three years, but inside wiremen could be four or five, meaning electricians that come to your house and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, my apprenticeship was four years, and I had to put in 8,000 hours, okay? 8,000 hours, that's, that's a full work year, 2,000 hours a year, four years, 8,000 hours, with classroom instruction built in, built in, and I had to take time off to go to class to do this kind of stuff. But what they've got here is this wage progression. So when you start off, you start off at 65% of a journeyman wage, and every six months, hey, look, it came back online. Every six months, you move up 5%. If you do your hours, and you do your books, and you keep time cards, you move up until you're at journeyman scale, right? So I like doing this as well, but I'm not gonna do it to you fine folks, but think about it. Think about how much time you spent in your undergraduate degree, okay? If you did 15 credits a semester, like a good student does, um, and you take that 15 hours a week, how many weeks is a semester? There you go, there's one semester in the books. Now do it times eight, because you did eight semesters for a four-year degree. Add that all up, and then for those of you that have master's degrees, add that time for the master's degree. How many credits was the master's degree? How many hours did you spend in the classroom? And I even tell people, I will give you a few hundred hours, hundred hours, towards your, towards your, your thesis. So you, you figure out what's fair, 300, 400, 500, add it on there, I don't care. And a lot of times the best people can come up with is somewhere between six and 6,500 hours for their bachelor's and master's combined. 
But a guy like me who did apprenticeship, I did four years and 8,000 hours. Okay? So if, it's a, if you're looking, I know it's apples and oranges, but if you're looking to get the hours spent toward my profession, I got you guys beat, right? So that's just our, but we don't look at it that way. You know, when I came here to te take my teaching job, I had all this experience and they were, whoa, this is great. You got all this experience, this is wonderful. The day I stepped on this campus as a faculty member, it was like I was born the day before because I didn't have any of those pieces of paper backing up my name. No associate's degree, no bachelor's degree, no master's degree. I was just the construction guy. I had 20, nearly 20 years of experience and a lot of experience running jobs, running crews, building you know, million dollar structures, but I was born the day before. You're just a construction guy, so just do your job. You'll be okay. We'll get you through this. What happens is we get this rate, uh, progression going. We get skilled and competent workforce, okay? The combination. So what I'd love to see is more of our two-year programs partnering with apprenticeship, apprenticeship partnering with two-year programs just like mine so we can educate everybody the same way. We can give them the opportunity to get education. If you're working in that four years, 8,000 hours, that classroom time could be with me on that machine, watching me speak, putting in clips, tracking your hours on the job site and earning a college degree while you're in your apprenticeship. And everybody loves the idea, it's just how do you pull it together? That's what I'm working on for my doctoral thesis. Okay, so apprenticeship training programs are struggling to attract young workers, they just are. Apprenticeship is making a comeback um, after all but disappearing, but we need to do a better job of, of blending the education and making sure that we're getting um, college credit to these students because that's what employers are also looking for. They want to see that combination, that soft skills, the skilled and knowledge worker is what they're looking to hire. Okay. Today's apprentices combine a chance for workers not only to master skills by earning a paycheck, but to get a college degree at the same time. There's research out there, there's examples that have worked. I'm hoping to start some examples here in Montana. National shortages, I'm gonna move through these because I've already been a bit long-winded. Seven out of 10 builders report there are shortages in rough carpentry. It's substantially higher than there, when, there, when it was at its peak at 2004, 2005. Um, this is just a short, this is from uh, 2014, just showing that 33% you know, carpenters, that's that shortage. Um, some shortage, 52% of the trade, you get all the way down to say H HVAC, excavators, there's a huge shortage, a critical shortage, okay? Um, manufacturing, okay, the supply. In 2014, there was 281,000 job openings in the manufacturing industry, and they could only hire 248,000. That left 33,000 jobs unfilled, okay? So we know there's a shortage out there. Montana, because my research was about Montana, we had a construction boom basically from the, two, from the year 2000 all the way to 2016 with that 2008 to 2010 lull, okay? Unprecedented growth in those three cities, okay? So Bozeman, Missoula, and Kalispell, those are all the pretty places everybody wanted to live and that's where everybody was moving, right? And so there was building like crazy. Short lull, 2008 to 2010, because of that housing mortgage crisis. What happened? Great, I'm sorry, Montana fared better than most states. Most states, when that housing crisis hit, it was, it hit hard. But we had something that happened to us at the exact same time, pretty much. Something that happened for us, or to us, depends on how you look at it, okay? That helped ease that burden, which was that Bakken oil play. So the folks that got laid off from their construction jobs, where do you think they went? They followed the interstate, and they went out here, and they got jobs. And they got really good paying jobs out there in the oil fields. And that helped out Billings, because Billings was the closest large city. Things started taking off in Billings again. So Billings didn't feel that housing crisis. If you were in the construction industry, you felt it. But as far as a workforce goes, you could get a job out in the oil fields. You could go to Billings to get one of the jobs that supports the oil fields. Things weren't so bad. Great Falls benefited. There were some companies, friends of mine, that started companies that worked in the oil field. They did pretty well. Great Falls didn't do so badly. Helena benefited. Just about everybody benefited. Okay. But what happened was, when they went out for those oil jobs, there was a lot of folks working in Missoula, Kalispell, Bozeman. Um, the main hubs where the growth was, Great Falls had growth, so did Helena. They're all growing cities. Sorry I didn't put Butte on there because it, it wasn't growing. It isn't, hasn't been really growing, right? But when those jobs went away and they went out to the oil fields, they got those good paying jobs, they didn't come back. When construction picked back up again in those cities, 
They didn't come, those four workers didn't come back. So imagine this, we had this huge bunch of construction guys. Half of them get, let's just say half of them, half of them get laid off. They went out and they started working in the oil fields because that's where the money was. Okay? Now we're back to building levels. We're back up to those 2007 building levels, if, if not higher right now. Those guys didn't come back into our industry because it's still going on out there a little bit less, but it's still going on, or they followed the oil money somewhere else. So now contractors, people in my industry, it's hard to find plumbers, electricians, carpenters, whatever it happens to be, because uh, those, those workers didn't come back. So we're trying to do the same amount of work, same level of work with half as much workforce now. Okay? And that workforce that stuck around, they were the old guys. They were the ones with all the knowledge. So what are they getting ready to do? Retire. We have about 130,000 baby boomers that are getting ready to retire in the next eight to 10 years. And this was in 2015, uh, Labor Commissioner Pam Busey. This was a quote out of the newspaper from her. No matter how you look at it, the math just doesn't work. We don't have enough young people to come in because we only have 123,000 16 to 24 year olds to fill the jobs. Okay? So we're already at a, what, 7,000 job deficit. And that's if they wanna get into these types of careers. So we talked about John Dewey, he didn't like vocational education. He didn't want to separate it out because he thought it would, it would create a stigma. And David Stern, who's an educational researcher, he says, I think history proved him right because we do see the tiered system between college prep, education and high schools, and you've got the vocational tracks. We see it in secondary education, right? Post-secondary education. I think many of you don't have to admit it to me right now, but there is a difference or not a difference, but there is a perceived difference among some of us and our colleagues about what happens in two-year schools versus four-year schools. Okay, so let's get to the good stuff. This is what you came for. This is what my research was on, all right? So I had high school respondents, A, AA, um, class B and C schools. What I did was I contacted a group of educators and I said, I have this research, um, please share it. I don't wanna know where it goes, who it goes to, just share it. I was hoping for 100 respondents, I ended up getting almost 200 total, that's a good thing. Um, my survey went to all different schools, all different sizes, so I think it was a pretty good random and a good respondent group. The thing is they had to be seniors over 18 years old because there's a lot of paperwork if you wanna do uh, research on anybody younger than 18. So I limited it to 18 and older, so college, or I'm sorry, high school seniors, and the survey was distributed by the faculty in those high schools. So my college respondents, mostly Montana Tech students because I have friends that teach, at Montana Tech, I said, hey, if you wanna give them a little extra credit, will you give them this survey? So a lot of my respondents were college students, but they were in the one and 200 level classes where you find a lot of students that just left high school, right? Um, survey linked by faculty members, some extra credit was offered in some cases. They didn't tell me, but that's, you know, they didn't have to tell me, we offered extra credit, we didn't. I know that some did, some did not. It was anonymous, I used Qualtrics to give it out. It was active for three weeks, March 2nd to March 23rd. So when we see the numbers from high school, it's late in the year, but there's still not that many 18 year olds in high school at that time. So it's hard to capture all those high school 18 year olds, okay? So we have a smaller number of them, but they are part of that, that group. I got 197 respondents with 189 completely completed surveys. They did every question and got rid of those that just yes, 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 yes all the way down the line because they were bored and just wanted extra credit. I milled, or I was able to parse those out. Here's what we got. So as far as gender, I had more females than males, which is a good thing. Um, high school, obviously more college students because they're all, or most of them should be over 18, so they're able to take it. Less high school because of that, that one constraint, but I like the number, I'm okay with that. We talked about our generational, right? The Generation X, 1965 to 1980. I'm right on the tail end of that Gen X. Okay, millennials, 82 to 2004, those are our students right now. If we're teaching students, they're in that millennial. You can see that by age, I have a whole lot of millennials, 25 to 34, they're still in the millennial. Uh, well, they're half, half are in the millennial, half are in Gen X. And then I've got a few um, older students, which is a good thing because I think that their opinion matters as well, but I was able to, to get both of those generations well represented. Um, some of the results are you, did you take CTE courses in high school? You can see that 55, almost 56% did, 44% didn't. Are you or did you take them in high school? So that's, that's gonna play in later. Um, were they offered at your high school? 
161. 85, almost 84% did have those offered in high school but did not take them for whatever reason. And there was only 31 that did not have the opportunity. The way the question read, basically, if you didn't have it offered, you couldn't take it. They were in a school that didn't have it, private school, whatever it happened to be. So I had 31 that didn't take it, only 16%. Were they important to your overall education? 7% uh, said, yeah, this is, I liked them. They were important to me, okay? Did you, uh, did you enjoy the courses? Over, uh, well, 7.68 out of 10, almost eight out of 10 enjoyed the courses when they took them. Did it make you consider a CTE-related career field? It dropped down a little bit to almost six. Six out of 10 said, you know, I took those classes and I think I, could, I might consider it. Do or did exposure to CT courses in high school influence your decision about post-secondary educational choices? Of almost the same number, six out of 10 said, I would consider it, whatever your post-secondary education is, apprenticeship, two-year degree, whatever it happens to be in the CTE realm. My objectives, identify statistical differences in high school and college students' perceptions, identify significant statistical difference between the respondents in regard to their gender, okay? So that's a big thing, getting women into the trades. Okay, for all you guys in the room, you can either plug ears if you don't want to hear the, the cold truth. My female students are better than my male students in class. As far as their attention to detail, they actually show up, they do their homework, and they are engaged. And when the, my, my male students, they'll, they'll do a project and they'll get it so far, and then it starts to get boring because their attention span is very small. Let's go do this now, and they'll leave this un, undone. It's my female students who go, you're not done. We need to finish this before you move over and do that. I love that, okay? So I wanna see if there's, you know, if there's a, any statistical, significant statistical difference in how they respond when it comes to gender and courses taken when offered, did they influence that post-secondary education, okay? So I did a two sample t-test and I, there's a few questions. The questions are on the um, X and Y axis. So for high school students, one of them that I put together were CTE courses. Are these trades jobs, are they menial, meaning Anybody can do them, don't have to do that much effort. You just pick up whatever the tool is and just do it, you'll be fine. Or they're actually meaningful. You can see that in high school, they were a little bit less. In college, they had a more, they thought they were more meaningful than the high school students as far as, as that skill set. So that's good. Is that that college influence? Hey, I'm in here doing college, but boy, having somebody who can do these things for me is a good thing. Um, does the term vocational have a negative connotation? It had more of a negative connotation, not by much, but more of a negative connotation for college students than it did for high school students, okay? Even though we tried to move away from that word vocational for a long, long time, but we made the mistake of moving it into an acronym that means brain damage, unwittingly, but they did, okay? Um, on the gender side, so the first one, how did the high school and college students see these jobs? They were, they, they were about even. Um, the gender, there was no stati significant statistical difference observed between the women and men when it came to their perceptions of career technical education. They're on the same level, and that's awesome. Right? You would have thought that it might have been skewed. Men are more suited for these types of jobs, and they're more hands-on than women. Nope. When I asked the same questions, they gave this, I mean, answers within my alpha of 0.05. They were the same. So that's a good thing. That means. While women still face unique challenges in industry, in today's construction projects have evolved to become safer and less labor intensive, making work conditions more favorable for women than in the past. They're also very well suited for crafts, such as instrumentation, welding, and electrical because they have superior hand-eye coordination. Sorry guys, but my experience tells me that's true. Uh, closing the gender gap is one less hurdle that industries who rely on CT-related skill sets must jump to recruit qualified workers. Okay. So there's a whole nother basically untapped resource is start marketing businesses, start marketing companies like a construction company I'm working with over in Bozeman and Big Sky. They said, we want more women. We want more women carpenters, project managers, superintendents, because we're building really high end custom homes and they have the skill set. They do really good work. But they said, we're having a hard time. How do we get the word out? How do we market to, to more women? Well, we have, to, we have to get rid of those gender biases. Okay. The third research question, when taken, uh, CTE courses taken when offered influence post-secondary education decisions. So you can see on the x-axis, did, x -axis, did you take these courses in high school? Did you take uh, courses and did they make you consider a CTE career? If you took the courses, you were obviously more likely, there was a 
big difference, more likely to, to want to or to consider a CTE career. If you didn't have those in high school, then you weren't likely to, to consider it, right? Well, that just makes sense. Okay, so for a school like Butte Central that doesn't have any real CTE offerings as far as skilled trades, how does a guy like me break through into that school and say, I can offer it through this thing, they can use Moodle, and they can come help us build on our job sites right here in Butte. We're building 10 houses for Habitat for Humanity this year, right? National Affordable Housing Network. We just stood three of them this week. Floor systems and wall systems. We're getting ready to truss them out next week. Uh, we built the carousel. We spent two years working on the carousel project down at Stodden Park. Uh, we do all kinds of not-for-profit. You'll see some pictures as we're having our discussion. I'm just going to throw up random pictures and let a slideshow roll. You'll see all the pictures in places that you know around Butte where we've made an impact by doing community service and doing good work. Okay. Um, uh, did you take courses in high school? Exposure to post-secondary post education, it was almost the same. Okay. Those CTE courses do make a difference. Courses when ta taken when offered influenced post-secondary decisions. Did you take career technical education? Uh, were the courses important to your education? Obviously, yes. And some of them, if there was no, they weren't that important. Did you consider CTE-related career versus did you enjoy the courses? If you enjoyed them, I got two little outliers there, but if you enjoyed them, if you enjoyed them, you were more likely to choose that as a career, right? Um, and if you didn't, it came down, but you still um, if they enjoyed the courses, but they answered no, they enjoyed them, but they still answered no, we can see that that was a bigger respondent group than those that said yes. And just a regression, um, were they important to your education? We can see one for one, two for two. Did you consider an education career? The more, the more important they felt those, those courses were, the more likely they were to choose or look at going into a CT-related career. Um, were they important to your education versus post-secondary career choices? Yes, they started looking, if they were important to them, they started looking at post-secondary options to get into those types of career, career choices. Um, perceptions of education are positive as, despite this consideration for CTE coursework training uh, or careers were low. They were, they were still low compared to what they liked about the courses, but they weren't as bad as we thought, right? Uh, are you, did you consider a career late? CTE-related career, there were more folks that said no than there were yes, even though we saw that those courses seemed important and they liked them and they enjoyed them when they were in, in high school. Um, it begs a few questions. Are post-secondary education and career choices decided early in the respondent's high school career or maybe even earlier, like in middle school? Okay? Does that stigma about being in the special ed wing, even though it's the trades area, does that stick in their head and there's no way I'm going to do that for a living? Are these types of biases built in? Because what I found in my research, this is just a synopsis in here, and you'll see it later, those that didn't have any access to it actually had a higher regard and a higher, they, they liked career tech, they thought it was more meaningful, and they had more respect for career technical education type careers than those that had the opportunity to take those courses in high school um, or middle school. So is there something built in? Is there something that's happening in those formative years that's moving them away and dissuading them from wanting to go into these types of courses or these types of careers. Uh, is there a societal, peer, and parental negative perception di uh, bias toward career technical education? I think there is. This is where I have to take my doctoral research and start breaking these things down and saying, society is saying, you're going to be a plumber, you're going to be a ditch digger, hmm, right? You're being judged. Peer, what do your friends think? Billy, you're going to ruin your life. My best friend told me I was going to ruin my life for going into an apprenticeship. Parental, I know, because they're not in here, I know my dad and my mom probably weren't real thrilled with the fact that I wasn't going to college, but they allowed me to make my own choice, and it turned out pretty well for me, right? But I know that they weren't real happy with me when I decided not to go to school. So that's, that parent, that's my, my, my experience, but I think it, I think it, it uh, applies to a lot more people, okay? And last, are, courses, uh, and, are, are these courses and careers so stigmatized that even though they are acceptable to practice and enjoy in high school, right? They enjoyed them, they liked them, they thought they were worthwhile, not, not a suitable career choice if you want to be a successful member of society. I think, that's a, I think that's a question that as you think about it right now, you'd say, that's probably true, but I don't know. Here's some, more, uh, some of the similarities between both groups one and group two. Now group one was the bigger group that uh, did have CTE options. 
Group two didn't. They were the ones that went to a private school or didn't have CT offered at all. Both value working with their hands. Both, um, both those groups, salary was not a high concern. And that's something we're learning about millennials and these, the next generations. It's not so much salary, it's satisfaction. Well, that should be a boon for our career in technical education trades, right? Okay, you can make good money, but it's that satisfaction. I mean, the other day I was having a terrible morning, and all I wanted to do was go home and go under, get under the covers and go back to sleep. It was a bad morning. But I got out on the job site, all my students were there, we started standing walls, totally reinvigorated, that's my motivation. I got excited, I was having fun. That's the kind of thing I love doing, right? Salary not a high concern, we'll value working with your hands. CT pro uh, career professionals are respected in industry and by other professionals, okay? They, they see that a plumber, electrician, carpenters, mechanics, you know, equipment operators, their perception is, hey, they're professionals and other professionals respect them, okay? So that, those are their similarities. What differences? Impacts of career technical education on Montana economy. Um, they didn't see them as having as much of an impact on the economy as we know that it actually does. And uh, RCT careers menial or meaningful, there was a difference between those two groups as far as meaningful and menial. What's gonna surprise you is it was group two, the ones that didn't have access to it, they found and they thought these careers were more meaningful than the other group did. Okay, uh, Scott, you've seen this before because I did this in our presentation, but this is uh, group one and group two, the two we just got done talking about. So I offered up which is the best way, the question was the best way to get into a career technical education. Okay. What do you see as the best way to be successful, to get that, whatever you need to do to be successful in those careers? Apprenticeship, a two-year degree, the combination of a two-year degree and apprenticeship, a four-year degree, or none. And what none was, you just go buy the tools, watch some YouTube videos, and just do it. Okay. That's our group one, the ones that had experience, had CTE in their high schools, right? Apprenticeship, this was 157 people, so the two lowest with about, I think it was 18, it's just under 20. The two lowest was apprenticeship and two year, it's stigmatized, apprenticeship, they don't run, they really don't know what apprenticeship is, right? They've never really been exposed to it. It's making a comeback, but they just don't know what apprenticeship really is, how many hours it is, how you get into it, and two year education in Montana is stigmatized. It's stigmatized everywhere, but I'm talking about Montana, it's stigmatized, so you can't go to two-year school, heck no. And apprenticeship, don't really know what that is, give it a low number. I like the fact that it bumped up when you said two years and apprenticeship, because in their mind, if they do have an idea what apprenticeship is, oh, that's more than, well, it's four years or more, so it must be valuable, it must be valid, so it bumped up. Look at four-year degree, through the roof, right, for this respondent group. Even though I don't think there's a program in Montana where you become a plumber, a carpenter, an electrician, a mechanic, other than a couple programs up at Northern where you get a four-year degree to do those jobs. They just don't exist. But in their minds, that's the best way to get there because it's a four-year degree. But look at none. How disappointing is that? No, I'll just watch YouTube videos, buy the tools, figure it out. DIY. DIY forever. Right? All those shows on Home and Garden Network, you can do it yourself. You know, you get nice hair and a nice clean shirt and a brand new tool belt and you go and you just take a sledgehammer and knock out load-bearing walls because you don't know the difference. Everybody's seen Property Brothers, right? That's who I'm talking about. They do that every time they have a special tool for finding load-bearing walls. It's called a sledgehammer. Anybody in the industry can walk through and go, yep, load-bearing, load-bearing, don't knock those out. They have to have a sledgehammer to figure that out. It's, it's pretty sad. Now, group two, a little bit of a difference, right? Now I realize it's a bigger skew because there aren't as many students, but look at I mean, apprenticeship, group two, they just didn't know what apprenticeship was. Two-year education, uh, weighted, it was, a, it was higher than most of the others in the other group. Two year and four year, or a two year and apprenticeship, that to them was the best way to get into these skill sets. And I would agree. It's a combination of education, soft skills, responsibility, reliability, and getting the hands on training over a number of hours that's going to lead to a good career. Four year education, still up pretty high. But then again, look at none. Just doing it, just picking up the tools and doing it still ranks pretty high among these groups. So uh, I'll tend to look into that some more in my doctoral research. Summary and conclusion, I'm almost done, folks. As our baby boomers prepare for retirement, millennials are expected to make up 75% of the workforce by 2020, okay? Um, so what we know is that CT courses do influence post-secondary and career decisions. 
We know they influence them. I wish they influenced them into them a little more. <coughs> they don't, but they do have an impact if they have exposure to them in middle school and high school. There's no statistical difference observed regarding gender and CTE. That's a good thing. More of this respondent group did not consider CTE as a career. Not many of them, but out of all of them, there were more that said, no, I wouldn't even consider that. And the four-year bus educational perception is prevalent among this respondent group. It's got to be four years, whether it's four years of straight you know, college education or that combination of two-year and apprenticeship. They have that four-year. Four years equals something. So, Billy, you're going to ruin your life. I don't think I did. I think I came out all right. right? And I like to point my friend's face and laugh every time I see him because of that. But then he's a cryogenic technician, so he points back and laughs at me because he's got a really cool title. Uh, oh, that didn't come out very well. Oh, there it is. So this is from the Billings Gazette. All I did was I linked a whole bunch of articles that say we need more skilled labor. This is the governor at a rally saying we need more skilled labor. Can't find a good man, hire a woman. Okay. Faced with labor shortages and growing business, uh, and growing business, more contractors are discovering the benefits of the X factor. Women are the X factor. Right? Let's start marketing to them. Let's get them into our industries because we're going to have a better product, I'll, I'll be honest. Okay. Skilled trade careers negate youth and parent perceptions, meaning it's that perceptional piece. Um, everybody wants to be a fireman or a, a, a policeman when they're young, but then somewhere along the line, those things change. I want to be a carpenter. I want to be a plumber. I want to be um, somewhere along the lines they change. It's also those par parental perceptions that we have to we have to get through. So I think that's the last slide here. Those are all my references. I'm going to put on some pictures here while you guys ask me questions. Well, I had pictures up. Do you guys have questions? Are you just like my students? Let's get out of here. All right, so as we're talking, these are the kind of jobs that we do around. This is the first fourplex built, completely ADA compliant, a partnership between National Affordable Housing Network and a college program to build this fourplex. Our very first house recipient was our admin assistant's son, uh, Matt, who had a traumatic brain injury. He couldn't live in Butte because there was no place safe enough for him to live in a wheelchair, on crutches. Um, it's Tony's son, you met Matt. Um, we built this, that's actually Matt's unit that, uh, it's funny, that's Matt, that kid up there is Matt. That's Matt's unit. He got the first mortgage, so he gets to move back to Butte. Well, he's back for four or five years now, but now he lives at Butte. But this was the first ADA compliant, that was the first ADA compliant fourplex built um, in the country in that partnership. And the Department of Labor actually sent somebody out to, to find out how we did this. So we've been trying to partner people up forever, and it just hasn't worked. You built five houses the year before, now you're doing this fourplex. And now we've, since, we've been doing this for eight years now, we've built probably over 40, between 40 and 50 housing units in this city using student labor and the connection with the carpenters and the project managers at National Affordable Housing Network. That's a big impact. That's neighborhood stabilization, right? This is them working on some of the footings for this year's uh, house. Here's, we're pouring the footings for the house. They're actually up there framing on those houses right now, okay? Anyway, um, okay. I don't know what it was doing there. There's our foundations down on the flat. We're going to do 10 houses this year. This is a gazebo that we built to help out a kid with this Eagle Scout project. Um, that's what that gazebo was. This is us standing walls this week. That was this week putting walls up, okay? Using big sit panels, structural insulated panels. They have an R value. They're a 40 R value because they're nine and a quarter inches of foam in between those two OSB panels. A great way to build. This is what we're using on my, our house when we build them because they're really energy efficient. But this is the kind of stuff that we do in our program, okay? So this is in the afternoon. The first three and a half to four hours every day when they show up at 8 a.m. is going through the college coursework or taking their writing classes, taking their math classes, and then always coming back when Heather and I are talking in the hallway, walking by, okay, get down to the shop and get going. They have to be somewhere. Even if they don't have a class with me in the morning because I have to do my first year and my second year, I always schedule my first, and first years or second years with an 8 o'clock class. I hate it but they come back later and they really appreciate it because now they can get up, they can go to, they can make it to work. So questions from you guys. Yes, oh, you had, no, she had, you had your hand up first. Okay, um, I am going to be advising some students in a few weeks time. 
I think you've done a great job of talking about the perception that people have. How do we get them to go kind of rethink CTE careers? How do we get them to think about that? Because I'm going to have some students that I'm going to have some difficult conversations with. And I've had students who've taken classes two, three times. They still want to be engineers. Sure. And maybe that's not for them. And having a CTE career is a great thing. Mm -hmm. But I can't get them to think in that sure. way. Yep. So how do we get people to think? One, we got to expose them. Okay. Expose them to these to these opportunities. So I've had a lot of engineers, they come to Montana Tech because that's what you come to Montana Tech to do, right? Become an engineer of some sort. Uh, and I've had some of those young men in the pictures there. They started in engineering and they went, you know, boy, this isn't quite what I thought it was. Oh, you have a construction and construction management program, which is a four year degree. And it does a lot of our classes overlap. What they do is they get more of the business side than the engineering side, but then they share courses with engineers and they're out working on those same jobs. They're not so much doing the design work, but they are doing designing the jobs as far as how the jobs go. Estimating, budgeting, scheduling, and keeping things. How do we get them in there? That's what I'm gonna work on in my doctoral thesis, is how do we change those perceptions? Where do we, is it in middle school? Is it in high school? Am I gonna be able to solve this problem? Probably not. But I wanna- What advice would you give me if I have to have these conversations with them? Uh, you could lay out, okay, what is it about engineering that you like? What is it, what make, what part of engineering is it that you really, this is why you want to do it? Well, I like to work with my hands. I want to be out in the field. Well, maybe engineering, did you know engineering is, not all engineering, but a lot of it, you're in the office, you're planning, you're designing, and you're going out there every once in a while. And I know this, and I'm, forgive me, right? Forgive me engineers in the room, but there are always ones with a shirt like I've got on, and a tie, and a really, really, really white hard hat. Oh, engineers are here, right? Now I want to be more hands-on. Well, we've got opportunities for that. What we should be doing more of at Highlands, and we're working on that, is partnering with the machining and the welding and moving them into getting those two years of hands-on, and then we supplement, we do more of a, a like a welding engineering technology, a machining engineering technology, mechanical engineering technology, where they're doing the two years of hands-on, they're actually learning the skill sets. So they become a mechanic, so they can do whatever, uh, whatever you know, welding machine construction but they're also gonna work in that field and get that four-year degree that we see is so important to them. I'm gonna be honest, the reason the, there's been an explosion in the growth of my program is because I've added that four-year component. It's okay with mom and dad. It's okay with the friends and relatives because no, it's not a two-year degree, it's actually a four-year degree. But my first two years is getting the hands-on. What I find out is it then becomes a split. A lot of times the ones that come in and wanna do the four-year degree they get enough skill set and they go, you know, I'm ready to go to work. Get out there. Get the education. Get the two-year degree first. That'll open up doors. You can always come back and get the rest of it. But it's, it's almost a switch. Those that come in and say, I just want to do one year or two years and get my degree and get to work, they're the ones that came from those shop classes. Well, I'm just not a very good student. I'm not good at math. I, I don't like to write. After two years with me here at Montana Tech, the writing classes that we have, the math classes we have, doing things like this, they realize I can be a college student. I'm going to do the four-year degree. And they go through and they thrive. They do a really good job. And those that came in thinking I'm getting that four-year degree, a lot of them say I'm going to I'm going to work. I want to get to work. So I kind of lost my train of thought on my initial question, but now you just mentioned after the two years of hands-on training, say machining in my class, what's the the further machining engineering that you talked about? I've got plans in the works, and so when I was doing the associate dean job and department head, I was building out curriculum, trying to match them up. We just haven't crossed. I was able to do it in the construction uh, for construction management because I partnered with business. It's a construction management, construction business management degree. It's basically one year in the engineering school, one year of business after you do the two-year degree with all the rest of your gen eds built in. And I've got plans for it. We just haven't made those those bridges. What I envision is when I proposed it first, and it was a few years ago. I told the mechanical engineering department, uh, welding engineering, I said, if you walked into our machine shop or a welding shop, and you said, if, you, if I offered up and I said, you can get a four-year degree doing these two first years, two years first, and then you can get a four-year degree, I said, half the hands in that room would go up. Really, you think so? I said, I know so, because I've talked to them about it. It's that four-year perception, I gotta get a four-year degree. So what would it look like? It might be like mine, where it's business, and then some of the welding engineering. And I had a real candid conversation with, with the welding engineering professor. I said, uh, just so you know, 
Your welding engineers can't weld. Well, of course they can. We have a whole class. And I said, no, that, that thing called fun with welding on the weekends, that's not learning how to weld. I'm sorry to say. So you imagine this. This is the, a guy like you. This is what I want to build out. You get the two years. You know how to weld. Okay, you become a pretty proficient welder. You get the rest of that education. Now, you're the person working between that welding engineer or whoever is engineering that design and say we've got a great big production floor and we have to get a product out by Friday. Okay, there's a lot of beams, a lot of steel work. You know, you're going to build a whole brand new baseball stadium. Our students will be the person that can work in between. They're taking the design, they're working with the designer, and they're putting it out there uh, on the shop floor. If two guys call in sick and I got to get this product out by Friday, my guy can fill in because he knows how to weld. If they're doing some welding testing and they're finding out that the welds aren't holding up or they're not going to meet spec, if the, just bear with me, if the welding engineer who can't weld comes down and says, you need to do this better, you need to weld like this, okay, show me. Uh, if they're, if they're real arrogant, they say, it's, it's, a, it's below my pay grade, and they're going back to their office. Whoa, I've heard that, though. Her eyes got like this. No, I've heard that. Anyway, so what happens is now I have just lost all respect for that guy because he's going to tell me how to weld. He can't even weld himself. Huh. And what do I tell? Everybody else on the shop floor. So our product, hey, we got to change this up. Employee says, hey, show me how you would do it. Our guy can show them how, right? And now... Credibility maintained, respect maintained. Again, two guys call in sick, we gotta get that product out. At least my guy can jump in there and we can still get production out. I think it's a missing piece. That's what I saw in the construction industry when I was working. I was a tradesman, but I was also running jobs. And I had to work with the engineers and the architects. Luckily, I had a good enough head on my shoulders, I could sort of speak their language. I could definitely speak trades. And I was able to bridge that gap. I think Montana Tech is uniquely suited to build those in-between folks as well. We just have to get over some of our preconceived notions and just do it. I mean, think about all the students. We're going to be capturing students like you're talking about. Um, well, this isn't the right place. Here's this option. Here's this option. You never know. That's what college is about, trying other things. If you decide what you're going to be when you're 14, 15 years old and come to college, like a marine biologist, right? Everybody wants to be a marine biologist when they're 14 or 15 years old. Are we all going to be marine biologists? Heck no. You get into college and you just get into philosophy. You get into writing, you get into construction, and you go, you know what? This feels good. This is what college should be. We got to provide more options than you're either going to make it or you're not. So, does that help? Is that good? Yeah, it does. I, I mean, I, I guess I'd be interested in hearing more about it later. I am, I spent 17 years in Colorado building homes, mm -hmm. but mostly kitchen and bathroom models. I was a high school dropout, and uh, I, I agree with you know the preconceived notion about mm -hmm. being a tradesman. I'll finish college and I'll, I'll never make anywhere near the money I made when you were I working contracts yep. with the Home Depot and I was building homes. But mm -hmm. it, it takes a physical toll on you. Yeah, it absolutely and does. It's really, you know, I'm still I'm going into machining so that I can still work with my hands, mm -hmm. but I'm not crawling around on my hands and knees. Yep. I still like doing that, but yeah, it does take a toll. And that was the conversation I had with that boss when I first started talking. So what would it take for me to get into this project manager position? Because I'm having to train your project managers on how to actually run a job. Yeah, you are, and you're doing a great job, but they have a degree and you don't. That was the conversation. So when I got offered that job, as a matter of fact, it's really funny. I was meant to be here. I was meant to be in Butte, Montana, because we bid the natural resource building where the petroleum and the bureau was, right? We bid that job, the company I worked for, and I had to break down those plans. I had to help the boss bid it, so I know that job very intimately. Boss says, hey, Billy, if we get that, you're moving to Butte. You're running that job for us. We took second. And in about three months later, I got offered a teaching job on the same campus. So one way or another, I was going to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad it worked out this way. So uh, who else? Nick? Bill, I just had a, you know, I mean, your, your research is really good, and it, you know, I mean, is there a national metric in place to help track the change in perception of the, of the, of the trades field? As in, you know, could, so, you know, I think, I think of it like, you know, okay, so the, the, the change from like a Votex school to, mm -hmm. a, to, a, to, a, to a CTE degree in college, that, that sounds like it would change the perception over time, but is there some kind of metric in place to track 
that change in perception? Not that I know of. Not that I know of, and I'm not sure it would make sense. Hey, well, like in anything, if we don't like, if it's not working, what do we do? Instead of changing it structurally, we just change the name and rebrand it. I feel like that's what we did with CTE. We just changed the name, but it was the same thing. Um, I mean, some of us older folks in this room, not me, I'm, I'm still pretty young, but older folks from Butte, what do you still call that building out there past Walmart? Is it Highlands College? What is it? Vo it's still the Votech, right? Generational. I mean, it's hard to, I uh, had a, a nice lady come and she came down, she had a lot of money. She made a lot of money working for the Anaconda Company. And she said um, she wanted something to do with her money and she, somebody said, why don't you go check out Highlands College? And she's lived here most of her life. She goes, the hell's Highlands College? She had no idea what it was. I thought this was the old Votech. She came down, we gave her a tour. She, she was a drafter by trade. She drafted and built out every, Sheila, Sheila Penaluna is her name. She did every, every tunnel under this city. She knows where everything is. And she made a lot of money doing that. She was so impressed with what we were doing down there. This is what I'm talking about. This is what we want for Butte kids. She left over a half a million dollars for scholarship for Highlands College when she passes, God forbid, right? But she was so excited about it that she started doing one scholarship per year until she passes away, one full ride for a deserving student. I mean, she had no idea what it was. Thank goodness somebody told her and she came down to check out what we do and she <clears throat> was so impressed that, I mean, when our foundation officer, when her lawyer said, yeah, this will fund probably seven to eight full scholarships a year, I thought his eyes were gonna pop out of his head. I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, that's like $600,000. Whoa. Right? First thing she told me was, I'm going to have a lot of people in my family mad at me because I'm not leaving them my money. <laughs> She's leaving it to us. She's leaving it to, the, to Butte. She's leaving it to the, the, you know, the next generation. Because she one, it's, it's Southwest Butte, Southwest Montana, but you know, that's what she wants to fund. That's a great thing. Did that help, Nick? I mean, yeah. I don't know if anything that exists that tracks that. I know that the, the data is tracked as far as who's working, who's not working. You know, we're in a shortage, we're in a shortage, we're in a shortage. Those are all the articles that I see. Have you been, has it been bridging the gap between the, you know, so you, you, know, you start off with the, you know, has the gap been getting closer between the demand and the, and the, and the filling the demand, or has it been? It's getting worse. It, it's getting worse. It's getting worse so for a lot of the, a lot of, the, it is a lot of the reasons that I'm talking about. Yeah. So. I think as a retired high school educator in CT, we have to market CTE. Mm -hmm. You've got to bring in successful people to the high schools and yep. to the grade schools. And the high schools have so many requirements for the college prep courses that they're edging out CTE. And yep. a lot of the kids don't have opportunities to experience them. Mm -hmm. So I think as everybody in this field's done forever, we need to keep marketing, marketing. Let them know that those yep. kids that are in machining and maybe go to Haver and get a degree are working on cruise ships all over the world, make it attractive. Exactly. They're not seeing that. No. No, it's, it, we haven't done a good job doing that. Um, college prep curriculum, I would argue that the college prep, prep curriculum now, it applies to career technical education. It applies to apprenticeship. That's what industry is looking for, is they want skilled knowledge workers. Okay? The days of just being really good at your job, you have to have soft skills because you have to deal with customers. Your face is that company. Uh, I see it a lot. Um, it's, they want skilled knowledge workers and they want to be able to tie in education. So one, that, co that, that college prep versus the standard diploma, that should just go away. The John Dewey, education's education, education, and try to find them, try to find them the right career path. Yeah. Scott. What's industry doing to support this? Because my understanding is that by the time the Votex originally popped up in the 70s, mm -hmm. industries cut back on traditional apprenticeship. We'll let those guys train them and yeah. then we'll hire them. Mm -hmm. Now they're screening for people, but are they, are they getting into the high schools and telling kids, hey, we need these skills? They are. Yep, they're getting there. Right now what they're doing is they're going to the high schools and they're trying to recruit right out of high school, which is not something that has happened before because that tells you how how much shortage there is how critical the need is and that's a good thing that's a great thing i'm trying to work with my industry partners to say sure i'm working with two companies right now saying all right you've got these folks how do we continue their education how do we keep them 
educated. So they said, we've got you know journeyman level carpenters, but we want them to have these skills. Can you develop courses that we can deliver? You know, they could watch you, they could do this type of thing. Maybe you can come over to our shop and you can help train them on the things they don't know. Because I see a lot of that. I mean, a lot of my friends that did go to college and then they went and they worked in the Bonanza over there. They went to Big Sky and they're building these big, beautiful homes. And when I was in Bozeman running that job, on weekends I'd run up and help them with some of their stuff. And just the, the things that I could show them that I learned as an apprentice, I learned from carpentry school, blew their mind. Where did you learn that? I went to school for that. I mean, this is what we teach. This is what we're supposed to teach. Anyway, um, so companies are coming around. Uh, I also teach apprentices in the summertime for Dick Anderson Construction. It wasn't going so well. Uh, I don't want to say it was me, but I just started treating them like college students instead of whatever they were taught or how they were treated before. Imagine this, a room full of guys who just got done working their 40, 50 hour week. They're giving up their Friday to come meet some dude they don't know, go to the office, go to their shop, sit down, open up this book. They don't know me. I'm getting to know them. I said, so, and I took over halfway, halfway through. They had somebody else instructing before. I said, so how did uh, how'd this class run before? And one of them says, you sit down, you open your book, you read the first paragraph, you read the second paragraph, you read the third paragraph, you read the fourth paragraph. We did that for four hours, all the way through the chapter. I said, oh, you were fourth graders. And they went, uh-huh. And that's why they had 15 to start, and by the time I got there, there were seven. They, half of them said, it's a waste of my time, why am I doing this? I said, how about I treat you like college students? You're responsible for the reading. I'm going to be a nice guy. I will. I'll go through and I'll highlight the entire chapter. I will send you the notes. I'm going to make it interactive. I'll send it. Give me your Gmail account and I'll send you all the notes. I'm going to align the PowerPoint that comes with this curriculum that the company bought. But I'm going to take my notes and put it in there with the PowerPoint. So if you're visual, you can see it and you're going to get those notes. You can align this. You can go through and take my notes and highlight in the book. A lot of them said, you know, this was awesome because I live in Bozeman. I got to go up to Big Sky. There's an hour ride. You know, we carpool. I can jump in there. I can do my homework on the way up to work. And I said, that's exactly it. You don't need to. I said, the other thing, when do you open this book and start studying for your time in this class? What do you think they said? Well, if they have meet me on Friday, it was Thursday night. And I said, overload. Too much. You can't get this all digested and understand it and expect to have a valid or a, a decent conversation with me about these things or even tell me what you didn't understand because you're just you're hurting your brain. So give me one hour in the morning or one hour in the evening. I know you've got family, you've got a dog you got to feed, you just got done working, your feet are tired, but if you can do one hour in the morning or one hour in the evening, and you do that, so I met with them every other week, I said, you'll have it all, and you'll be ready to go. And what you don't need to do is, I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to go over all the stuff that you already know, so you guys write down the questions about the stuff you didn't understand and don't know, and that's what we're going to cover. And then we're going to go out to the shop, and we're going to practice, and we're going to try it. And these are apprentices. I thought, so when I was an apprentice, I was a jerk, and most of the guys that I was with were jerks, right? I mean, we already know everything. Young and you know, ambitious, we knew it all. These guys, as soon as I opened up that door, I said, I'm going to treat you like this, and here's what do you want to learn. You show me, and we'll do that. They were sponges. They couldn't get enough. Right? We ended in uh, November was the last class. They said, when, okay, what's the next level, and can I get my books now? I want to be ahead of you. That's, now they're taking ownership of their education. I want to be ahead of you next time we see each other. And I still get... Hey, Merry Christmas. Happy Thanksgiving. I've got a relationship with them. When's the next round starting? We can't wait. Because they felt like they were being treated like adults and they were learning. So, and then I took over in Helena too. So I started in Bozeman and then I went over and started doing the Helena apprentices and did the same thing because they were told, that, they told me they did the same. You read this chapter, or you read this paragraph, you read this paragraph. And we start actually practicing. I, pretty soon the ones that kind of filtered away by the time I was at the end of that October, November time frame, I had more people in the class than I had ever had before because they were coming back in. Word was spreading, hey, this is working. So that gets me thinking, why aren't, I, why aren't we linking what we're doing right here to your education, college credits, with that apprenticeship? They're doing it on their own. So to your question, most companies are trying to do something on their own, start their own apprenticeship, get their own books, and find somebody to teach it for them. You can buy a canned curriculum. You can buy a certain curriculum, I'm not going to say the name, comes with an instructor manual and the book. And they go to the superintendent and say, well, you know this stuff, here. Here's the instructor manual, it tells you what to do. You just teach it, okay, here's the, here's the stuff. That's what wasn't working because, as I said before, 
I'm doing this as a second career. This is my new career, my new vocation, teaching and being effective and communicating well. Some of them have the skill set, some don't. Some are like, I'm a superintendent, I got a job to run and you want me to come and teach these guys on a Friday? That's my day off too, right? They don't have time for it. And it didn't go well. So now I suggested, hey, reach out to your tutor schools, reach out to the folks that know how to educate and let's partner up. So now I've got the superintendents on board with these companies saying, how can we help you? What materials do you need? What do we got to do on the job sites? I said, if we could align the lessons with your job sites, you're Dick Anderson, you have a lot of work going on. So if I'm doing the sheetrocking, taping, and texturing chapters over the next three weeks, maybe we could take those Fridays instead of me setting something up in the shop for them to work on. Let's go out to one of your job sites. Let them rock, let them tape, let them texture. And you get it for free. Because they're doing as part of their education. Oh, I can get it for free? Yeah. Oh, yeah, now they're into it because they don't have to pay a subcontractor to do this room or that room. So those are things that I'm going to work on in my dissertation, make those connections, find out what industry needs, and try to align what I think is really valuable, the two-year component. We've got people that know their, they know their trades and they know how to teach it. So how do we get that out into, into those industries? So they're doing it, but they're, they're struggling because everybody's trying to, we're all cowboys. We all want to do it our way. And so a bunch of those companies are trying to do it their own way. They're coming around, I think. I admire what you do. I really do. Um, Thanks. I have some friends that have gone through your program, and one of them is in Salt Lake now, and a uh, mm -hmm. full-time job, and loves it so far. John. John. Yep. Yep. And uh, the one thing, kind of piggyback off the marketing, um, you know, after coaching at Butte High for a year, I've asked some, some of the seniors, what do you want to do? And they cringe with the, you know, oh, maybe I'll go to the Highlands. Have you ever considered having some of your students, including yourself, go in and talk to those kids? I do it all the time. Yeah. My students are my best recruiters, without a doubt. Matter of fact, uh, the football coach said, hey, we got this kid coming. Uh, he contacted us. He's from Indiana, West Lafayette, six foot four, 300 pounds. There's a thousand colleges between Indiana and here. And he was highly recruited. He wants to come to Montana Tech for your construction management program. The two years, the hands on. Somehow he heard about us. Sometimes I feel like we're the best kept secret out there. People just don't know we exist or what we have to offer. <coughs> so to your point, I'm gonna be gone next week. I'm taking 30 students down to Reno, Nevada to do a bid competition. Two year students, four year students, combination with Scott's wife, Sonia. Awesome opportunity, right? This year we really got a good blend of students and I'm pretty excited to see what comes of it. Um, so I'm going to be gone, and he's coming while I'm gone. So I've got three students that volunteered say, we'll take them around. We'll show them around. We'll show them what we do. We'll take them to the job sites. They're my best recruiters. When students come in to check out the program, you guys have been listening to me for, shoot, an hour and a half now, right? I can all talk all day. You got me going. Construction and education, those are my two passions. I'll go all night. I can go all night on this, right? They get tired of listening to people like me. So. At some point, when I see them starting to glaze over, even though they're interested in the program, I say, but you know what? Enough from me. Go talk with them, okay? They're out on the job site. I take them around. If you get a day off, if you can get a day off of school, come over. I'm just going to put you in the classroom. You're going to buddy up with that guy. You're going to be that person all day long. You're going to do the writing course, the math course. Wherever they go, you're going with them. Come out to the job site, and you're going to see what a day in the life of one of my students is like. And I say 99% of the time, we're sold. I'm in. That's what happened, you know Mick, Mick Pathhausen. He's a Dylan boy. You don't, you don't come to tech if you're from Dylan, that's for sure, right? You don't do that, that's blasphemy, right? You go play for Western or somebody else, just not tech. But he's the fastest kid in the state and everybody wanted him. And Coach Morell wanted him for football. He'd been everywhere, nothing interested him. What about construction? Uh, maybe, I just wanna go back to Dylan and farm and ranch. That's all he wants to do. He comes, talks to us, I said, well at least you would could build the straightest, best buildings because I know how farmers and ranchers build. You could, at least you could build good stuff and save yourself money because you don't have to pay for it. He spent one day with my students and there was an article in the paper about it. He didn't even tell his mom and dad. He signed, he went to the bookstore, bought a sweatshirt. At dinner that night, he pulls it out, and hands it to his mom and says, I signed with tech. And he, he's one of those, he did the four-year program, two-year degree, four-year program because he's playing football. He had an excellent opportunity to do almost the same job as John, going out to the Seattle airport and working a big caisson crew, big caissons for the foundations for that huge addition they're putting on there. His mom said, he came to his mom and said, should I do it? Mom comes to me and says, well, she didn't come to me. 
she told me, she's like, of course you should do it. Go out there, explore the world. The ranch is always gonna be here. Unfortunately, had a back injury. It was undiagnosed, had to have surgery, so we couldn't go do that job over the summer working as a project engineer with the hands-on. That's why my students get hired, because they have the hands-on and that, that business and engineering background. They can understand both sides, both sides of the job. Back injury, had to have surgery. So we got an uh, internship with Vigilante Electric, the real co-op for electrical, for electric service down in Dillon. Same skill sets. You can bid this, you can estimate that, you can actually go out and do some of the work. All right. They offered him a full-time job upon graduation. And his mom came to me after a football game and said, that doesn't happen. They don't offer full-time jobs. Those are jobs people have for an entire life. And they just offered him a full-time job. So now Mick has the best of both worlds. He's working in the degree program that he went to school for. He's loving it. And he's at home and can farm and ranch. So I, I, like I said, I could talk about my students and their success stories all day long. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I appreciate your your comment, I do take students. I get them into those classrooms. I haven't talked to students. We just did it uh, the first week of classes, went to Butte High and talked to a group of students. I took three of my students with me. They're all Butte High grads or from Butte. And we'll see if that bears any fruit. But 16 year olds, 17 year olds, 18 year olds, there's a lot of stuff going on in their heads. They don't know where they're going, which way direction they're going. They're also getting influenced by society, by peers, by parents to do almost anything but working with your hands, unfortunately. So. All right, you guys tired of listening to me talk? Well, thank you. I hope it was enjoyable.